but something was said on the table that really offended me and I I had to speak up about it. If I didn't say something, then that would end up being on TV and I'd be partly responsible for that. Hi folks, welcome back to another episode of The Combo Couch. I'm Lawrence. I'm Sun. And on this week's episode, we have a special guest, storyteller Gabriel Fa'atau Satu. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What other themes do you explore? Um, a lot of the roles that I write for are generally catered to women. Like I was saying that it's so important that I honour um, my mum, my sisters, my just all the women that I've grown up around and the different types of women that there are in terms of not only physicality but also kind of mentally and emotionally. And so, yeah, I think just playing, just writing a lot of gender neutral roles and female roles. And I'm kind of mindful that, um, especially as a man, that when you have this kind of idea on who, like whose story are you writing? And, 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 and it's so hard for me because, you know, I talked about me auditioning for these typical, very stereotypical roles. And so for me to write or create a role specific to women, um, I'm mindful that I'm not a woman, and so I, I only pl write what I know, I guess, but I still make sure that I insert a little bit of myself in there, so writing about a man with surrounded by various women. I saw a, a short film, and that changed my perception on what I wanted to do in my life, so I quit my full-time job, I um, enrolled into study, so I completed my undergraduate in creative writing and I made sure that all the papers that I did were catered towards specific writing but also writing for screen and stage because I wanted to write script specifically. Yeah. Plays or film scripts? Both. Okay. Yeah. So you've sort of broadened out towards those areas since your undergraduate days? I think for me, like most of my professional career, is writing for mainstream TV. <laughs> so I've done a lot of script writing and storyline writing. But for me, it's um, that area of writing was always very. Um, there's no nice way of saying it. Um, it's it's probably the thing that's made me feel like I was always there. It was very tokenistic, like I was always used to write, to, uh, I was always there to tick a box. This idea of being diverse and inclusive. And so I was really aware of that. And I mean, they paid really, really well. <laughs> but I always made sure that my presence there wasn't just to tick the box. It was um, allowing myself to educate the other writers in that room with me who weren't of colour and so I wanted them to understand that actually we're not here for the for the kind of short run that we're here for something a bit more long term and that we want to include our stories and show kind of multifaceted levels rather than just this very kind of direct line of just the stereotypes that we often see. I always think it's important to acknowledge the way our people speak in terms of mm. traditional oratory and the way the patterns of their stories are told and they're not kind of linear and they don't work in the normal three-act structure that the kind of typical mainstream Hollywood kind of ideal works in. Okay, have you tried to merge the two forms before? Um, I'm doing that right now. I've done all this research kind of in the past year and a bit, so I'm looking at three different methods of storytelling. One is the Fatmatai, the governance system. The second one is looking at Fangongo, so that's another traditional form of storytelling, and that is a, is a form that kind of requires very little, and there's different interpretations of it, but for me it's looking at, it's kind of up to the ability of who the storyteller is. So for instance, when I'm telling you two a story, I can do whatever I like. I can sing, I can dance, 
as long as I kind of engage that with you in this kind of circular setting. So it's looking at that form of storytelling. And then the final one is looking at the tata, so which is the traditional tattoos, not what I've got currently, but looking at um, the patterns, what they each mean. And I mean, in my discovery of the tata specifically, I learned that that form of storytelling actually began with women. And so I, I want to honour that some way. So those three main forms of storytelling are specific traditional storytelling yes, methods? Yes, or very specific to Samoan storytelling. Okay. I think I just grew up in this very kind of Western way of like education and school and stuff. And so for me, being Samoan was something that I just kind of left on the side. It wasn't something that I kind of completely ignored. I still acknowledge that. Yeah, it was just something that always kind of happened in the background. And when there were certain events that we'd go to, so say a wedding or a funeral or whatever, and a lot of those practices that I talked about, they kind of come to light. So mm -hmm. when you have like a birthday setting, in terms of like the formalities and whatever, um, there were times that a Samoan chief would speak and things were happening and I didn't quite full understand what was happening. But in the back of my mind, I knew that was something that was very important to, to my heritage, I guess. Yeah. Okay, no, it's great. I think sometimes if you're in a creative industry and you're going along your career, it's nice to go back to your cultural roots and your heritage mm. and to bring that into your work. Yeah. So you grew up in New Zealand? Yes. All right. And what brought you to Sydney? Um, well, my family migrated here, so I was left there on my own. Um, and I decided to make that move. My father was unwell and I wanted to be here closer to him. So I live with him now, which is great for the most part. <laughs> what was your plan of attack, I, I'd say, to kind of battling, the, like, oh, you think I'm just a tick in the box? I'm going to show you. Say so when I first started writing with the TV show Shortland Street, I um, was very quiet on the table. And I'm a lot louder than I usually am. But I was very quiet on the table. I just observed how everyone behaved and what they said. But something was said on the table that really offended me. And I... I had to speak up about it. I mean, I don't want to say what the issue is, but, but I knew that I, if I didn't say something, then then that would end up being on TV and I'd be partly responsible for that. It's the same with like bullying and racism and whatever in kind of everyday life. Like I think if you're not part of resolving that, then you're part of the problem. And so I think it's so important just to use your voice and speak up, regardless of what the situation is. And I mean, it took a lot <laughs> for me to do that. And I'm so grateful that I did because when I did that, it, it impressed the producer, for instance, and then she extended my contract. She was really excited about having someone that was quite vocal on the table in terms of in terms of being that kind of diverse tokenism, whatever, tick box kind of person. <laughs> yeah. So, but does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that, that's oh, okay. cool. So in terms of um, storylines that you had, what was the one that you're proud of in terms of uh, one you've done on Shortland Street? based in New Zealand what was one that you're proud of or a couple that you feel really strongly wow. about um, can I say none <laughs> <laughs> your best work is yet to be done good it's a, a good way to I'll take that out <laughs> I think for me it's like um, what I said that earlier was um, working with mainstream kind of I, as an artist I think it's so hard when your voice is compromised yeah, I, I often find that even though that kind of work paid me the most and whatever, it's the work that I'm least proud of. I always find that mm -hmm. the work that I do kind of independently with the community, another word that I hate, <laughs> but that kind of work, um, even if there's no money or very little money, I have full control and I love that. Young artists, emerging artists, the I find that a lot of them are discouraged to pursue the arts because they're not, 
succeeding in terms of funding. I just think we're robbing them of kind of their experience to be an artist. Like, that's not fair on them.